right. Uh, can everybody hear me on the mic if it's like this? Um, no? I guess I'll just be holding it. Um, how about this? Pretty good? Cool. So um, make sure that you guys sign in with the tinyurl.com slash kaggle decal 9 link. Um, yeah, just regular form. Let me know if it doesn't work. I'm pretty sure it does, though. So, cool. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about, oh, actually, I realized I made a mistake on this slide. But I'm not talking about bias variance straight off. That's for uh, Joseph next week. But I will be talking about a little bit about unsupervised learning, but mainly focusing on the uh, tasks of clustering and k-means. So um, basically, uh, yeah, here's a quick outline for the lecture today. And so you may be asking yourself, what is unsupervised learning? And so the Wikipedia definition is that we're basically inferring a function to describe hidden structure from unlabeled data. So, um, you know, in contrast, though, it's stuff that we've currently been dealing with, like linear regression, logistic re regression, and k-nearest neighbors are all supervised. So to make that a little bit more clear, here's some mathematical notation. Um, basically, in the, um, in the supervised learning case, you have your data point. So this is like your features in the house prices data set. So like full floor plan, uh, square footage, et cetera, would be like the X part of this portion, the supervised learning portion. And then the Y component is essentially the label you apply. So back to the house prices example, this would be the uh, price of the house. Or in the Titanic example, whether or not they live. Or um, in the MNIST case, whether, what number it is. So in unsupervised learning, you don't have this liberty of having this label. So a lot of times, there's a lot of tasks that you just like, you just have no idea what the label is, and it just becomes like, um, oh, there's a number of way to, ways to really approach this. And it can create some really, really cool uh, results as well. So uh, what we will be focusing on, so actually, let me just run down what um, is possible in unsupervised learning. So there's three kind of dominating areas, unsupervised learning as we know it right now. The first of which is clustering, and which is what I will be talking about during this lecture. The second of which is neural networks. And um, we won't necessarily be branching on to the specific unsupervised learning versions of neural networks, because there is actually a supervised learning of neural ne uh, supervised learning um, version of neural networks. But there's a lot of cool stuff that is involved with um, there is a lot of cool stuff involved with neural networks, and I invite you to kind of just do the research on your own. Um, specifically in a subset of the uh, neural network paradigm called Hebbian learning. Um, and one, one phrase that can get you somewhere in your research is just basically uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if you're interested, Google that, come talk to me after. Um, and then the third and final case that I'm going to be, that I'm at least just going to mention is just anomaly detection. And if you notice in the uh, top right, there's this image of a like a cluster of uh, different points. And then there's one point that's kind of sticking off way at the very end there. I mean, it's like a really small dot at the very end. And so that's the basic idea behind anomaly detection is that you're basically, you have your set of data and then you have like one data point or a few data points that are outliers essentially. And um, this is pretty key in a bunch of different areas. Like I, I know that um, in uh, data centers, knowing that you can detect like an anomaly will basically let you determine whether a data center is going to fail or like um, basically you have some kind of like intrusion from a malicious adversary or something like that. It's a very, very applicable and very useful skill. Again, I won't have time to go through it in, this, uh, in these lectures here, but I recommend you go through and kind of do your own research on that as well. It's really cool. So um, let's, let's move on to clustering. Basically, clustering is a, a notion of bringing together a bunch of data and grouping it based off of similar characteristics. And so if you remember from last time, we were talk when we were talking about uh, k nearest neighbors, um, we, had this, we had this notion of distance that we were kind of invoking to use as classification, right? So in k-means, there's, and I mean, in clustering in general, there's this notion of distance that you're going to be using to like, identify things that are very close to each other. And so basically, you just say like, oh, if, the, if this uh, Euclidean distance or whatever distance metric we end up using say, states that's everything close to each other, we'll probably want to group them together. And um, one of the first algorithms, or one of the earliest algorithms, and actually one of the more popular ones that does this really well is called k-means. Um, yeah. So the basics behind the k-means algorithm is that you basically, you, the k inside of the k-means is a hyperparameter. That just means that you have, uh, you're looking for k different classes or k different uh, separations. 
So in like many simplistic approaches, it's like you choose three or something like that, but you can get, you can scale that to any number, right? It's a hyperparameter. You, you're free to choose it however you want. Of course, the actual proper choice of a k-means depends on your um, your actual application, and um, yeah, it, oftentimes you'll have to tweak what the exact like value would be. So let's let's dive into the k-means algorithm here. So the first thing we do is we initialize k centroids randomly. Basically, we have like an idea of what the domain is. As you see in this graph, we can like guess like what the extent of all the data is, and we will basically just randomly pick some points in around that area. So uh, I guess in this first example, we'd basically pick two points because we want to identify two clusters. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll go through every data point that we have, and we'll just find the one that's closest to those centroids. Um, the ones that are closest to those centroids, basically that are closest to every single centroid, they will be labeled by that centroid. Uh, just to make that a little bit more clear, let's say we have a centroid C1, which is in the bottom left there, and a centroid in C2, which is in the, in the top right there. So all the, all the ones in the bottom left circle would basically be labeled like C1, centroid 1, and all the ones in the top right would be labeled centroid 2. So then what we do with all these labels, we go through all the points that are labeled properly, and we take the average of all of them. And now those new averages of those points becomes the new centroids. So basically, we've been able to move the centroids into like, what we think is the right area for them to be in. And uh, from there, we just repeat steps two and four until there's no new uh, clusters, being, no new data points labeled. So basically, that means that um, the cluster points don't change because we don't update the means at that point, since if we, if we try to, it would just be the same thing, since the labels don't change at all. And uh, that just means that like, the algorithm has converged to a, well, if you want to talk in more like optimization terms, it's converged to a local minimum. So cool. And here's some more math uh, behind all of that. Basically, uh, same thing as I was talking about, you initialize uh, k clusters centroids, so uh, mu 1 through k. Um, you take the arg minimum of all the clusters to every single data point. So that basically means just find the closest centroid to the data point. And then you would just adjust the, the uh, centroid by taking the average of all the points there. Cool. And so, demo. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Right. Cool, cool. Actually, I want to show you one thing before I uh, move on. So um, I'll take a backtrack real quick. When I was talking about um, some of, some new some uh, the unsupervised learning methods, there's this cool thing that came out uh, in the past like three years, and the inventor actually had a talk today at Berkeley called uh, generative adversarial networks. So they're a type of neural network or architecture that requires like two different networks, and they both kind of compete with each other to become like um, really good at each of their assigned tasks. One of them is meant to like generate some images. The other one is just to determine whether or not those images are fake or not. And the cool thing is it can generate some amazing, amazing things. So what's happening in this video right here is the, um, the generative adversarial network is being trained on a bunch of pictures of Pokemon. So it's like, um, like uh, some high res, video, some high -res uh, photos. I'm not sure what the exact ones look like. But as you can see here, what it's doing, it's taking all these images as dating, data points, and then it's able to like find some kind of approximate pattern involved in all of them and is able to create these kind of new looking uh, Pokemon. So there's, a, there's some aspects of them that are a little bit shady. As you notice here, there's kind of like globs and stuff, like I can pause it right here. Like this may look like, I don't know, like Charizard or something like that mixed with the like, uh, I actually don't know Pokemon that well, so it's like the horse Pokemon to me, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, uh, but you, you can kind of see that there's like the shapes emerging here. And this, is, uh, this can create some really, really cool things out there. So uh, yeah, well, when we get into the neural network stuff, I'll kind of I'll try to maybe make a uh, bridge off into this kind of area of neural networks because they they are really exciting. Let's make sure this is good. Cool. Um, all right, and maybe we can wait till the very end of this and see how well it does. See if we can spot some like um, characteristics that look pretty pretty cool. Um, yeah, maybe this is like a mix of Pikachu, but you also notice that it has some like some uh, you know, mistakes going on like there's this emergent like little hole in the middle of all these images here so like that maybe just the uh, network approximating like a, a mouth or something like that so it's still got a way to go before it's like anything crazy but um, there have been a lot of tricks to make things like pretty realistic and um, maybe I'll show just one more video since we have a little bit of extra time today um, neural painting so this is another thing based off the same algorithm uh, I can find it. Uh, 
Um, I'll look for it. I'll look for it in a second. Uh, but we'll come back to that. So okay, back to k means. So basically, what I'm gonna do is run through the the k means um, algorithm and like how to code it in front of you guys. So I actually provided the exact same template that I'm going to start out with for you guys. If you guys want to follow along, it's just in the Git repo. Um, just make sure you get pull from the latest um, the rate, the latest push, which was maybe like an hour ago. Can you guys all see this k means in class? Those of you who have get pulled. Can anybody not see it? Okay, cool. So at least it's in the repo, so make sure you can do that. I'll wait a second for some other people to pull. But I'm gonna look for the the other thing. Oh, actually, this is not what I was looking for, but these are pretty cool, too. <laughs> so I'll just talk about these real quick. So basically, uh, kind of the same idea. It's um, it's uh, basically has like a huge data set that it trains on and um, uses the same kind of paradigm where one tries to trick the other, and then the what well, one network tries to trick the other network, and then the, the second network tries to basically discriminate what when the first network is trying to trick it. And so what it can do is actually take in these like textures, basically, I mean, these like very simple photos, and um, is able to actually transfer some like pretty cool textiles on, textures on them. So like basically like that. And you can pretty much change it as long as you keep kind of the same color palette. As you notice here, they're able to just regenerate some new stuff. And this takes like, on, if you have the proper hardware, which is like pretty accessible in, uh, nowadays, it's like maybe a um, three to eight minute train time to actually develop one of these. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, all right, back to lecture. <laughs> Um, so the first thing you need to do, of course, is import all of this stuff. In case you're wondering what this MPL toolkit stuff is, basically I wanted to plot in 3D, and so that last import is just gonna let me do that. Um, that should run, hopefully. Cool, you may get some warnings, don't worry about it too much. Oh, wait, hold up, one second. I need a cheat sheet. All right, okay. So the first thing I wanna code is um, actually getting all these random centroids in. So I'm just gonna try to go with this. Hopefully it like kinda works. So the first thing we wanna do is basically um, get all of the points, load all of the points in. So first thing I'm gonna do is basically just uh, make this new thing called centroid, actually. Yeah, centroids equals x.copy, so basically so we just don't manipulate anything. Then I'm going to shuffle these. So what this does, what this method does right here, is it essentially um, just rearranges all the items, and it's the faster way to grab like a random set of them. And then we're going to return centroids. Okay, so we're basically just, re we're just basically returning the uh, first k elements. And so you may be wondering, like, why did I choose these uh, these first k elements of the uh, data set, data set being x, to actually input into the, um, as the random centroids? So it turns out, instead of, like, searching the entire domain and figuring out, like, what are all the possible values in there, what you can do is just literally just grab some data points in there and just choose those as your starting points. And that's a lot easier than trying to, like, pretty much take statistics of the entire set data set, especially when you may be dealing with something in, like, the order of millions of data points because then you have to iterate over every single data point to properly do that. When instead, you can just shuffle it and then like, um, and then just take the uh, first, first uh, k elements that you want. And so those are your new, your new centroids. Pretty easy, pretty quick and dirty trick, um, but it's very convenient and it works pretty well. So the next thing we wanna do is basically um, find all the points in the data set that are closest to our centroids. So now we have our new randomized centroids, and uh, maybe you can imagine our first run, we take all the data points, and we just want to find the ones that are closest to it. And so I'm going to cheat a little bit, and because I've already done all this stuff, 
And this may be a little bit like out there, but this is like a quick way to do it. And I don't know how you'd actually pull this out in maybe like a pra in practice. I'd honestly just Google until you'd find the right answer. Cause oftentimes something like this is gonna like be given to you. But um, what you basically do, something like this. All right, so quick and dirty hacks. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> Basically, uh, I take the square root of the um, distances between the points and the centroids. This um, mb.newaxis stuff basically makes me allows me to broadcast it across every single centroid. So I'm basically just taking the uh, points and subtracting every single one. I uh, minimize the distance, and then I uh, take the sum. And then I'm left with like a, uh, I think a three row uh, matrix, which has the distances from, or so K row matrix, my bad. K row matrix, one for every centroid and the distances. And then I find the centroid index, which is the smallest one. So essentially this is the same thing as uh, running that argument that we saw in, in here, right here. Cool. Also, I do have the cheat notebook. It's, a, it's just kmeans.ipoimb. So if you, um, if you get lost at any point, you can just look at that one at, for reference. And then um, what we will want to do is now that we've calculated all the points that are close to, close to um, all the centroids and we've labeled them properly, what we're, going, we're, what we're going to want to do is actually calculate some new centroids. So what that's going to look like is we're basically going to make a new uh, list called cluster, cluster points. And then, um, we're, so what this is going to look like is going to be like each element will be the corresponding to the uh, kth or the ith, uh, the ith cluster. And so those are all the ones that are going to be labeled with that specific cluster name. So range. And so just to run through everything that I did here, basically I took all the points that were equal to that cluster label. So um, in, you can imagine in the first run, we just take all the label, all those points that are labeled zero. Then uh, we take the mean of all of them. That's this dot mean part right here. And we will add it to the cluster point here. So when we say the dot mean, it basically takes the dot mean of every single dimension there. And so what that allows us to do is uh, effectively take the point that's in the center of all of them. And then we return the mp.array so that we can do, do some awesome matrix calculation on it. And um, I'm not, I didn't actually leave this one for you guys or for in class because I thought it would be, um, I don't know, kind of out there. So what all, all this uh, function does, all should stop really does is just uh, determine whether or not um, the old centroids that we've saved so far are the same as the new centroids that we've just calculated. Or, or as well as it has a catch for iterations. So sometimes you can get into a state where your k-means gets into like a oscillatory state. So it'll just like keep jumping between two other things. And you don't, you don't really want to do that because that just becomes computationally actually like infinite, right? Like you're just never going to get out of that. So you want to catch for the iterations. What was your question? Um, you have all like at the end, right? But it's a built-in method. So uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, that one. Like, uh, you're talking about this one? No, no, the one down. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So the mp dot equal basically just equates all the the um, the points, and it just runs through each one and says like, oh, are these equal? The dot all takes all of those points. So now, so you can imagine mp dot equal will basically give you a list of booleans. So it'll be like like let's say uh, centroid uh, one is the same, centroid two has changed, and centroid three has changed. So what it'll do, it'll give you like a array. mp dot equal give you true, false, false, and then dot all will be like true and false and false. 
if you know what I mean. Yeah. And then um, it'll uh, just re it'll give you false because uh, the and statement will reduce to false at that point. Make sure that you've run all these because I have not. <laughs> cool. And now um, we're at the final step where we collect all this together and we make our k-means algorithm. So the first thing we want to do is uh, take our centroids and basically just get the random centroids. So invoke that uh, method that we just made a second ago. So we just take the data set and we just input k. And now it will randomly generate us some new centroids. Uh, all right, and now to the next to do. So we need to save our old centroids. So basically, pretty simple. Old centroids equals centroids. And oh, if you notice here, we have a while not should stop. Basically, just invokes that other method, ch checks whether the centroids and old centroids are equal. And in the first run, of course, they will not be because it's none versus like some randomly uh, some some random subset of the data set. All right. Now we want to um, assign the labels for each data point. So labels equals just get labels. Again, we're just invoking functions we've already made. And then finally, we want to assign the centroids based on the data point labels. So as, as the note says. And so once again, just invoking that method we made. And I think we're good to go. Yeah. So hopefully that's all good. And this last this last function that I've added here, I've basically um, it's just like a quick plotting tool. So it should be all set up in all of your stuff. And all it does is just plot stuff in 3D. So make sure you run this cell as well. And finally, we get to the testing part. So um, yeah. First of all, we need to set our labels. And, uh, oh, 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 whoops, this one piece. So if you notice up here, I basically return centroids and labels. So this just returns the, um, the you know, centroids and then all the labels for the specific class after we run k-means to convergence. And so just make sure that you type in the centroids comma labels. And that's equal to k-means, um, uh, let's see, data set. So in this case, I didn't actually explain that real quickly. So in this case, um, x is the uh, data set. That's the Iris data set. Basically, this is a common uh, machine learning data set where you have a bunch of um, data about iris flowers. So I think the, the ones that we definitely know are the petal width, the sepal length, and petal length. I, I'm not a flower expert. I don't know what those are. But they do have to do with flowers. So that's, that's good enough for me. Um, and then. Let's get back to the k-means thing. And then we want to figure out what our k-parameter is going to be. So for simplicity, I'm just going to deal with k equals 3. There's also a pretty good reason for that. With the Iris data set, there's um, actually three classes. So we hope that um, in our k-means clustering, it's actually going to dif differentiate these three clusters, just to like, kind of give it this idea of uh, this algorithm running. So hopefully, when you run this, um, it shouldn't throw any errors. And mine threw an error, so that's no good. Um, Name cluster. Oh, whoops. Let's see. So if you guys ran into this issue, well, oh, I apologize for that. Um, closest. Oh, okay. Thanks. Let's see. All right, uh, normally you should probably put like test statements in between um, your function calls. That just makes it a lot easier to run out, to find these errors before. I mean, this is a smaller problem, so it's not a big deal. But uh, I found a lot, of t a lot of the time when I'm doing kind of sci-fi development, I like put a test case right, after right underneath I write the, where I write the function, just so I can evaluate it as I run through, in case something breaks along the way. So um, I mean, just to give you an example, I would just do something like this, um, like get random centroids. Hopefully, I've already imported some data. I would just be like xk. Uh, x3. And so that would just give me some random centroids there. So yeah, that, that would only work if you've actually successfully run this cell here. So um, yeah, now let's, let's try it again. 
And cool, it looks like it actually converged and there didn't seem to be any problems. And so now what we can do is uh, actually plot this data. And you should notice here, actually, here's an interesting thing. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, actually tell you what's up in a second. But um, yeah, there we go. So you should get three distinct clusters. Um, it turns out, as you notice in the last example, that I got, it was a little weird that I got like a whole set where the like blue examples that I have now were all red for some reason. And then there was like a little blue cluster. And I think like a bunch of you probably have gotten that if you've uh, run it without doing anything special. So um, if, if your thing works, there's a high chance that you actually ended up in a thing called a local minima. So effectively what, what happens there is that you just, you end up choosing a centroid point that um, will like actually converge to a completely different point in the true centroids. So there's, um, there's a few ways to deal with this. And then, honestly, it just requires you to rerun it a few times. As you notice, I just literally reran it and it went away. And that, um, that's kind of like the key thing to go uh, forward with this. And the way to figure out how well your uh, clusters do is by basically calculating the distance from um, all the centroids and then um, just adding all of that up. Basically, when you've converged already, you take, you take all the data points and you take all their labels. And you just keep find, the diff find the distance between the data points and their uh, appropriate labeled cluster center. You add that up together, and that'll give you the score of that k-means run. And so something like the, uh, maybe I can get it again. I'll just kind of cheat until I get it. Yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, uh, oh, okay, here we go. So here's a case of local minima. Um, so in this case, we would, this score that I'm talking about, I forget the exact name of it, but it basically would uh, give a really high value for that because all your distances for, uh, for the stuff in the green cluster here would be really, really high. And while uh, like the stuff over here would be kind of small, but like still, this stuff would really outweigh it, and so this score would be weighted a lot higher than that. Um, and, and at that point, you basically know that you're probably wrong. So in a, in a, uh, in a like, true environment where you're running k-means, what you do is you'd probably run it like 100 times or something like that, and just pick the one with the lowest, the lowest average distance, or, uh, the lowest uh, sum of distances from the centroids, basically. Um, any questions? OK, cool. So uh, now I want to show you guys how to do this in uh, sklearn because like actually implementing this yourself is kind of impractical and oftentimes sklearn has will has done it better than you probably will and so um, you're welcome to go try out and like try to make the best bomb k-means algorithm ever but like sklearn has done a pretty good job at that so um, yeah What you basically do is you just write um, estimator equals k means equals three. And just to give you a rundown, so this is the way you would initialize a, uh, whoa, oops. Make sure you import this line. Make sure you spell everything correctly. And so uh, let me just run over the, the uh, signature here. So we have the n clusters. Basically, that's your k, that's your k parameter here. And then um, this initial value is just like how you would uh, properly initialize k-means. So um, I wouldn't too worry too much about that. But um, then you have your, uh, your init value. Um, actually, not sure what that does. But then there's max iteration, which is uh, the number of iterations you want to run before you actually give up on k-means. So you can avoid stuff like uh, bouncing between a proper point. And then you have your tolerance, which is basically like how much uh, like kind of fudge data you'd accept for a distance function. So basically how much like error you'd, you'd be okay with to say that these, uh, this distance matches this other one. And so if we run this, hopefully, yep, there we go. That works well. And then like all other uh, sklearn algorithms, you pretty much just do estimator.fit. And remember, our data is stored inside of the x matrix. Cool, and now we have a uh, like hard to read estimator thing, but we know now that we can actually grab all the values from it. And so um, the way to get all the labels for the data points is just labels equals estimator dot labels. Uh, I think that's it, yeah, there you go. And then you can, uh, actually I can just print this out real quick. Um, 
so yeah, you can see there's a bunch of labels here. So um, yeah, one for each each data point, and then um, want to get the centers out just for a comparison. So this would be the same as uh, our centroids call from before. Um, and finally, now we want to display our data. Um, X labels. And bam, it looks very similar to the one that we did up here. It, the colors have changed, but um, you can still tell that the same dominant cluster centers are still there. And actually, if we output the, uh, the cluster centers side by side, so centroids is the one that we generated from the k-means we implemented in during this class. We put them side by side. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, that's right. I'm, we still use that weird one. Um, by the way, random seed.5 for this specific data set will like, always give you a good looking cluster. Um, And as you can see, uh, these are literally just a one-to-one -one mapping. So um, you, uh, they're, they're definitely not in the same order. You notice that this, this row right here is corresponding to the second row up here. So the second row for the k-means, for the sklearn version. But um, you can still kind of match them together. And they're like, they're, there really is no difference. And so uh, what we may want to do is actually compare this to the uh, labeled data set. So um, this is a little bit of a toy problem. Like you probably wouldn't run clustering on IRIT, like this kind of data set because you already have like data um, labeled already. But um, if you did want to, uh, you could just we could just compare it. And it's uh, if you're if you're following along in the, the cheating um, notebook, you see that I've labeled it as the ground truth. And so all we need to do is just run plot k means x y. And you can see we did a pretty good job of clustering. Like uh, most of the data points that are close to each other are properly named, and they're like close to what the actual labels are. So um, this could give you a notion of what the true labels should be, or kind of give you an idea of what kind of labels could be out there. So maybe you're um, you're a data scientist for some research lab in biology or something like that. You could run like k-means clustering to figure out like what two, three different possible values are of your genotype or something like that. Just be but just based off of like the clustering of all that genome data. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, just to run down. So as I mentioned before, um, I mean, they're all the same. <laughs> no, I mean, like, so you're saying that most flowers will be, like, they'll have the same genotype, but they won't Oh, oh, oh. So uh, this is just basically the, this is the data that we read in. And so the three dimensions correspond to the three dimensions that we're plotting. This data actually has four dimensions, but we just use the three most, like, important ones. I didn't pick these. These were picked by somebody else, but, like, Oh yeah. yeah, just to, yeah. I I don't know the exact uh, the exact uh, correspondence. Maybe I can check real quick. Oh my bad. Yeah, I I, I figured I'd fi miss something like that, but I'm pretty sure it's from here. Um. Oh, here you go. Here you go. So there, there. It's called the iris data set because it's three different iris flowers. So one of them's the setosa, one of them's the versicolor, one of them's uh, vir virginica as you notice right here. And so I'm pretty sure Satos is the uh, zeroth. Um, Versicolor is the set is uh, one and Virginica is two. If we, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more concretely. So you see here, there's this Y data set, the labels. And so um, the first, the first uh, third is like the um, Satosa, the second is Versicolor, and the third is uh, Virginica. Um, I, let me, uh, yeah, let me check that for sure. Um, how, how would you check that? Wait, do you, do you want to make this announce? 
So what was your question? And Joseph, could you yeah, say it a little bit? I'm trying to just explain like how you would use, like what the usage of uh, K means would be actually. You want to like try to like an actual real world usage of it? Oh, let me think. Oh, oh, actually for the um. Oh man, no, I actually use a different clustering algorithm, but um, let me think. Uh, wait, wasn't that that was K nearest neighbors, wasn't it? Yeah. No, we're just talking about K means. Right. Oh, oh yeah, actually, that's a pretty good one. So, uh, you guys all you guys all took 1681A in the past like two, three years, possibly. If you, yeah, yeah, four years. Okay, you took it a while ago, so maybe they didn't have the same project. That was before Max Max existed. Okay, yeah. So, actually, do you want to run through that? You like actually worked on it, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the idea of k-means is less, it's not really classification as much as it is finding groups within your data. Um, so I mean, in maps, I think you recall, we were creating these like clusters of like south side restaurants, north side restaurants. I think a decent way to view it would be if you have some data, let's say we have some data set of restaurants and we don't know anything about where the restaurants are located in Berkeley. So think back to the old maps project. But we don't know anything about the locations. If we run k-means on them, we'll notice that there are certain, there's like a south side clump on Durant or whatever. There is some north side clump on Euclid. So it's more about finding data, like groups that are related to each other more than it is classifying data points into some group, if that makes sense. Um, I don't think that the usage is very good in maps personally, so I don't want to focus too much on that. But yeah, I mean, it's basically like, trying to find groups of data rather than classification. If you think of it as classification, then you're kind of going to a different direction. Because we don't, in k-means, like, use some sort of training data to predict other stuff. It's just finding groups within a general data set where everything is labeled. So yeah. I'm just trying to uh, figure out how we could. Well, you could use it for classification, but that's not really the, the, the most common usage. Did, did you do anything with uh, MNIST with k means or? Oh, you had that data set. Do you still have the notebooks, perhaps? Uh, I don't have notebooks for it, but. Oh, wait, you sent them to me. I, I could probably pull them up. I did send you some pictures, which you could. Oh, oh, yeah, I, I, I can definitely, I can definitely pull those up. Um, hopefully, I, I don't get to too many like notifications. Curriculum channel, I cool, cool. So, for the k means algorithm, you use like three, three, uh, three or k as a three. We were using k as three. So, yeah, why did we use k as three with this data set? because we know that there are three clusters. So if we're trying to group our data into certain cluster, well, actually, I think it'll make a lot of sense with this. So it just, just needs to be image files, yeah. Oh, sweet. Okay, um, cool. So you remember MNIST from the other day. So if we, if we use a K of 10, uh, I wish I had sent you a different picture, because this looks Oh, yeah, yeah, let's get it. But uh, yeah, let's so actually oh, that, that one. Yeah, here. So if we use a K of five to try to classify the MNIST digits, we know we're not going to make each cluster an individual digit because there's 10 different digits. So with k of 5, we end up getting this as one of our clusters of digits, which I think that's probably partially a 6, maybe a little bit of a 5 in there, maybe a 2. But clearly, it doesn't actually represent any individual digit. Um, it, but we can get some good results, for instance, with k of 20. This is one of the 20 clusters I got. This seems to have encapsulated a lot of ones and probably some nines and maybe a couple fours as well into this cluster. But you can see that it kind of emerges as an I, which is a little bit more readable than the last one. At yeah. Least. Um, and then with the K of 10, we get a very nice cluster that corresponds directly to one of the digit classes. In this case, this cluster is clearly clustered, mostly zeros, probably very few other digits, all into this particular cluster. So the, the zeros were all located in a region that ended up getting clustered with one of the 10 centroids into this group. Um, I believe with the K of 10, there was some confusion between nines and fours, because those can look very similar. But, uh, and both of my nine and four clusters became sort of a blending with a slight top bar. But you can see how on the MNIST data set, you sort of get clusters that clearly match up to your original data. Which, I mean, if you didn't know already that you had 10 data points that represented digits, you could, d using this gets you a better idea of sort of the topology of your data. You say, oh, it works really well when I use this number of clusters. It shows me very clearly defined groups. I want to see whether I can like create a classifier that splits these groups apart, such as what we're doing with K-Nearest Neighbors. Oh, here, cool. oh yeah, and there's, there's actually, uh, if any of you are taking CS189, avert your eyes, because this <laughs> is my CS189 homework from last semester. 
So that's what you got in MNIST with 5. If you go down, you'll see what I got with 10. Um, oh, perfect. So it gives you, so basically a usage of k-means tends to be like finding groups within your data that you might not have known were there that you can then try to separate out to get a better prediction of the classes. Uh, what is this one right here? That's with 20. That's with 20. Oh yeah, and you can see this one comes out like pretty cleanly. Of course there's a few like uh, re repetitions, right? Yeah. Sevens oh, yeah. and everything like that. I mean, you can always see that the zeros are very clearly delineated from the other classes. I mean, it gets a bit confused on pretty much everything else, but the zeros are really just split off. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> so uh, anyway, there you go. Cool. It's like the last homework in the class. Okay. So yeah, I think it means it's tough to explain because it's less clear in its usage than something like regression, where we're just like classify housing prices. But it definitely has uses um, a lot of the time in more early data analysis stuff. Yep. Um. For the most part, that's it. If you guys have any more questions, uh, come talk to me, I guess. Um, all right, I mean, raise your hand now, actually. Cool. Um, I mean, I can just give you a quick rundown of some other, like, or of another clustering method. I actually used this uh, summer at my internship. So basically, I was dealing with a lot of uh, location data. And so one of the hard things with location data is that you have, um, we want to find, like, hotspots in there, but we also don't want to consider, like, times when a, uh, location data is made while somebody's moving. And it's pretty pretty easy to end up re running like k-means and stuff like that and actually picking up all these spots where somebody is moving. And then um, if we're trying to identify like key key locations or something like that, we don't want to identify like intersections and stuff like that. One of the best ways to approach that is this thing called density-based clustering. And so um, the algorithm is called uh, dbscan, the, the one that I particularly used. And what it does, it basically weights clusters based off, or like potential clusters based off of like the number of points that are near it. You give it like a, like a distance value that you should say like all these points should be near, be near each other. And so um, what that allows you to do is actually identify these hotspots and effectively locate where like important places are for somebody if, they're, if you're looking at their location data. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can go with clustering. Cool. Hey. It shouldn't be running for you. Yeah, you you ran like. Oh wait wait wait! I actually didn't in include uh, percent matplotlib. That's probably it. You should do that. Yeah, because otherwise it'll try to launch in a separate process and get very bad. Um. space in line. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and just make sure you run that. Um. Yeah, so, okay, that's, yeah, I apologize for that. Um, it worked on mine, so I was like, oh, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm not yeah. sure it's different versions of my Python. Uh, it, I think also, like, if you're on Anaconda, I bet that's a problem, and if you're not, if you're in Docker, it isn't for some reason. Uh, yeah, Anaconda's fidgety. Um, yeah, I can show you more of these videos. <laughs> Let's see. So this one right here is basically a floor plan from a bunch of Japanese blueprints, I think. And so what it'll do is it's effectively novel, novelly generating some new floor plans here. So yeah, you can see it's like pretty similar to what we were talking about before. And uh, you can see it slowly evolving. Oh, but there's another thing you could do too. I actually just found this earlier. Uh, huh? Uh, location labs. Sounds about right. <laughs> checks out. Hey, um, what am I thinking of? Let's see. Uh, another cool thing that you can get with this is you can actually do some cool arithmetic with faces. So uh, you can see these are some freaky faces that uh, the generative adversarial network uh, composes. But you can see they're like at least marginally human. <laughs> Um, and so they, what they have here is they have like a smiling woman and a neutral woman. Take like a new, add a neutral man, you can get some smiling man. <laughs> Let that haunt your dreams for the next few weeks. <laughs> but um, 
Sometimes they look a little bit better. But this this was really cool. You're able to actually like subtract out glasses and like transplant them onto other images as well. I thought that was pretty exciting. And then uh, you can creepily move people's faces. <laughs> I wonder if there's anything else cooler in here. Oh, this is this is my favorite part right here. This album artwork stuff. So they actually take like a huge data set of album covers and they're able to generate stuff that like maybe an alien would listen to. You can see there's like there's an attempt to make some like some letters here. And you know, they're in the proper place, but still it's like a little bit off. But the coolest thing about all these images is that they are like you can actually prove that they are novel images. So you can take like a distance function between all of them and um, between all of these points and the like data set and you know that they're not like just literally a copy of the data set because that can happen in a lot of these like generative models they'll literally just take a point from your data set and just display it and they'll be like oh that's pretty realistic but because it is the original point that you got it from these are not exactly not these are not exactly just from the data set they're just like composed of a bunch of different pieces the algorithm learns like the general pieces of the general like idea behind it and it's really cool so yeah all right. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can talk about. <laughs> are they? Are, what are they for? I mean, what are they using? I'm working on this thing with deep reinforcement learning, and I have some videos of deep reinforcement learning. With uh, the generating like audio or something? I mean, yeah, a video or something? Yeah, it's like um, playing a variety of video games with like oh. Q learning with the neural network backing. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I, I think I brought them up actually one lecture. Oh, because I was doing. Have you heard of uh, DDPG, the Deep uh, De Deterministic Policy Gradient uh, uh, paper? I don't know. It's like Probably. I think it came out like two months ago or something like that. It's deep reinforcement learning under. Um, it's a, under a few different modifications, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What's it, what's your research on? Um, it's basically. Uh, basically focused on certain types of memory layers for